Uh, so um, I think today we talk about quite a lot of AIIB things. So uh, hopefully I will give you a little bit more information or else maybe basically can summarize uh, some of uh, quite a lot of you to talk about the topic and the economic um, uh, benefits uh, for China and also the, the, the national interests and whether the Canadian government should have the strategy to, to, to deal with the rise of China, etc. So um, I, I don't think I will have a, um, a, a um, conclusion about the implication for China, but we'll have some kind of discussion point, and hopefully I can also um, hear your advice and opinion and comments, and I can improve my argument um, at the later stage. But um, today we'll try to mainly focus on the like the um, foreign aid or development aid in terms of the norm, and particularly looking at uh, if we're talking about foreign aid, um, they're basically um, uh, foreign aid have, have been happening for many, many years uh, already. But um, to bring it closer, so since the end of the Cold War and how, like basically there are two um, general or broad questions if we're talking about foreign aid, how aid or whether there should be ODA or o Overseas Development Assistance, whether there should be o o um, foreign aid. And the second question is how aid should be given. So this kind of these two board question basically generate a lot of the discussion and conversation, and and we can see the whole world or maybe separate into two different uh, kind of boardly into two different side and well how A should be given. So if we talk about the end of the Cold War um, uh, by the end of the 1980s or the beginning of 1990s. So the OECD country, because the, the collapse of the, um, the communist regime in European, in, in European uh, region, so um, the OECD country, they basically dominate the foreign aid, the area. So you can see by the beginning of the turn of this century, I think over 90% of foreign aid um, contribute by the OECD country. And so they are kind of like the, the set up the norm. This is the OECD norm, how A should be given. And so what is the norm is like the high policy or governance conditionality. And particularly at the end of the uh, 1980s, um, I think if we're looking at um, a lot of developing country, um, particularly in African country, um, the debate is why the, we are providing foreign aid to them for many years or decades and why they're uh, economic situation, the economic development is still very backward, or um, they are still in debt prices. And so, in the 19, the end of 1980s, I think World Bank, or um, together with the ADB as well, Asian Development Bank, they conclude so the key uh, for development is good governance. So the so-called good governance, they have so many different um, conditions. Uh, one is politically, you have to have like the political reform or the democratic uh, system, and you have to have an effective, accountable uh, government. Um, and economically, you also need to have your open market, the liberal economic order. So this kind of condition, so, um, so since the 1990s, they set up the idea about if you receive foreign aid from the OECD country, you have to follow this condition. You have to have open your market for us, and you have to have your political reform in, inside your country. So this is the high policy of government conditionality. And in terms of the China that side, basically China mainly uh, focusing on bilateral aid before. Um, if you're looking at the figure from the Chinese government in 2012, uh, from 2010 to 2000, 2012, only 2% of China's foreign aid uh, provider through multilateral channels. So the question is a, a little bit interesting here. Is like why China need to establish the multilateral development bank, the AIIB, right now? And so because China used to have the bilateral relationship more than multilateral channels. And so for China, it's like the, the low policy and government uh, conditionality. As long as you recognize China is the only China or the one China policy. So that means like Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang are part of China. If you fulfill that kind of policy, that means you are already fulfill the condition from China, basically. So it's a low or almost without any condition. So um, the second idea or norm uh, about foreign aid is about um, the Thai aid or anti aid. So um, the OE OECD country, they used to have Thai aid, basically, the percentage is very high as well. 
But I think the discussion about um, Thai A is since the 1970s. And then at the, um, the, the OECD country ch try to generate the compensation, the foreign aid should uh, help the country to develop rather than help your own country, the economic interest in, in the developing country. So they try to restrain the use of Thai aid. And the, uh, as a result of that kind of conversation and uh, the discussion, in 1991, they signed the agreement, health thinking agreement, to restrict the use of Thai aid. So the OECD country basically agreed and then in 2001, um, the DACs can, uh, also, the regulation also recommend uh, to use untie of A. But of course, um, if you can see uh, quite informally, um, quite a lot of country um, uh, from the Western country, they still use Thai A informally. So it's a little bit hard to check. And also depending on which country as well, some country, they, the percentage of Thai A is a little bit higher. Some country may be almost uh, untie all of the foreign aid. But then on China, that side, if you're looking at China, um, China basically maybe uh, use the, the old method, uh, the OECD's old method, Thai A is the, the major focus. And um, according to the figure, if you're thinking about um, China's foreign aid to developing to African co uh, country, accordingly, I think roughly 70% of China's infrastructure investment to African continent, uh, use Thai A. That means you have to use the Chinese product, Chinese labor, or the Chinese firm, um, etc. And the 30% are basically you can uh, allocate it to theoretically allocate it to the local firm uh, within that continent. But that 30%, basically the local firm, they are also franchise, maybe with some Chinese firm as well. So they are basically um, majority of the foreign A are Thai A. Um, that's the Chinese, uh, the bilateral rate, uh, the bi bilateral aid they use. So, um, so if you're talking about them, um, they also both sides have critiques as well. One side is like, if you're talking about the high policy conditionality, and um, quite a lot of uh, conversation or discussion right now is talking about whether this kind of high political conditionality is a contemporary form of the colonial standard of civilization. So in, like, you impose your own norms and, and rules to another country. And um, they also criticize about the informally to use the Thai A as well. But on the other hand, you also you heard about a lot of people uh, complain about the Chinese A, whether China is a road donor, just very care about the resources, you know, taking all the natural resources from African country and back to China and without care about the environmental development or the political system. Um, at the corruption in that um, continent. So there's both sides have a good thing and bad thing or the critiques. So I think um, in terms of the um, AIIB, um, you heard about a lot. I tried to um, brief um, here about the background, um, how they established the AIIB and you know the, the, the initial capital is 100 million, uh, billion and um, the membership and etc. So one point is here is about the membership, um, including 60% of the OECD country, they are members of the AIB too. So if you talk about like two different kinds of like the setting, OECD versus AIIB, so their membership are overlapping to each other. And if we talk about the G7 as well, G7 right now is four out of the seven country are founding member. And if Canada become an, another member, of the organization that will be only two of the G7 are still out of the AIIB. So um, here I try to um, compare with the existing um, multilateral development bank and the AIIB. So um, the World Bank and ADB, they're basically dominated by the OECD country, so their norms and, and rules uh, follow that, um, that line. So they both have a, um, the existing bank, um, they the objective is slightly different with China's, uh, um, China's initiated AIIB. If you're looking at the um, one is the, to, for poverty allevi alleviation or eradicate poverty in the region or in, and in the developing countries, and the AIIB's um, uh, objective is to finance infrastructure construction in Asia. That means it's a project based uh, uh, foreign aid. But the, the other World Bank and the ADB, they are kind of like the project or the, um, the program aid uh, policy. 
And if you're looking at the largest voting uh, powers, um, AIIB basically mirror the World Bank's uh, system, the setting. So because of, well, under the World Bank, the U.S. has the veto power because if you have any important informa- uh, decision to make, for example, the, the, the structure um, of the organization, the structure we form, you have to get the majority um, uh, support so that th- that majority vote is the 85%. And U.S. holding slightly over 15%. That means the U.S. have the veto power, the same as the IMF system. And AIIB is basically similar. So you, you have any um, any important decision to make, you have to pass uh, 75% of the the, the veto um, the power, the, the voting power. And China right now. Uh, basically occupy 28%. So this figure is slightly a little bit different, but always uh, over 25%. And I think the lowest time is 26 point something percentage. Um, so it's mirror the World Bank situation. And uh, one of the interesting things, I think uh, I have to take the, the reference from Greg's uh, article as well, is about the, what is the innovation or the difference between um, AIIB and World Bank and ADB is about the governance structure. Because the governance structure here, the World Bank and ADB, they are basically use um, the in-Western board. So travel of the Western board, for example, the ADB, they are living in Manila, the, in the Philippines, uh, at the, head, the headquarter uh, over there. And the AIIB, they use that, um, that non-Western board. So the, the, the board member, they don't have to live in Beijing. And they are on page up as well. So this is, uh, I think, Greg have more information about about this situation. <laughs> and uh, procurement policy is about also ADB restricted to the members only. So the members right now is uh, 67 members. So that means if you are not a member, you basically cannot beat the contract from the ADB. But if you are for so the AIB, is kind of a little bit different. It's no membership restriction. That means. Uh, for example, if Canada is not a member right now, but Canada can basically beat the contract um, if Canada wants it. And so, so, in, so in general, there are two development institutions on foreign aid. So one is the OECD, the other one is the AIIB. So the question in my research is basically trying to answer these two questions, and how will China make use of the AIIB to become a significant new player in global development governance? and how far China can reshape the conception of the normal. So the normal is like the OECD, um, since the end of the Cold War, become the normal in terms of the, how A should be given. So whether China can reshape this kind of concept uh, in global uh, governance of development. So um, in order to have an idea about these two questions, so trying to looking at the lending practice of the AIIB, and because of the AIIB, so it's fairly new, it's just slightly over one year. And if you're looking at um, so far, there's only six uh, projects they approve or, or um, they have approved um, to lend money to, to finish the, to develop, uh, for this uh, infrastructure project. And this project, including like um, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, um, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan again, and, um, and Burma. So these six projects already approved by two different bat- uh, batches of the loans. So the first batch is uh, in June. They um, approved the f- first four projects. And then um, in September, they approved the second two projects. And then India and, pa- and Kazakhstan, um, these two uh, applicants, um, they basically uh, approved the, the idea of the project, but just waiting for the board's decision. So the board will have another meeting in uh, December. So maybe we'll hear about that um, soon. So in total, among these six projects, um, in total the AIIB land um, slightly over 800 million um, uh, foreign aid uh, to the countries uh, on the list. And so if you're looking at this um, the general picture about that, we can't make, make a conclusion because it's still too early. And in terms of like the 829 million, the loan, 
compared with the 100 billion uh, in uh, financial capital uh, of the of the organization is still fairly small. So we can't really have a conclusion. But if you're looking at this table, there are basically uh, two observations, or quite easy to observe, uh, is like the first one is um, the project concentrate in Central Asia. So you see Pakistan, Tajikistan, and, and, also, and also Pakistan as well. So Pakistan is the biggest uh, winner because Pakistan basically uh, occupy 400 billion of the total loan. So almost 50% of the loan go to Pakistan. And then the second observation is quite easy to see is like AIIB also collaborate with other existing multilateral organization. So this is two board questions or, or the two observations we can see. But then the question is why? Why they will have this kind of incarnation or the tendency? So if you're thinking about um, um, China's um, foreign policy, or the geostrategic policy of the AIIC. So why Central Asia? Why Central Asia will occupy quite a lot of uh, lending uh, project? Um, you're thinking about the, um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, in, in China. So few of the Stan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, they are also member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And Pakistan and India, they both were accepted as the, as the a member of the organization this year in June, and their membership will be recognized, I think, um, uh, in 2017, so next year. So they are linked with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And Shanghai Cooper Cooperation Organization is basically a security-oriented uh, center organization. So they think about the security issue much more. And so, and is it? Also linked with like the geostrategic, um, the security interests of China as well, because you think about the Xinjiang area. We talk about Xinjiang. I think I, I did have a conversation with one of the um, audience here. Um, he uh, studied in Xinjiang I just, um, the, um, before, and um, so Xinjiang is quite famous about like the three evils of uh, forces in China because. Uh, the Beijing quite worried about the, the, all the security threat, basically, right now, most of them coming from Xinjiang, the area, because there's like extremism, separatism, and terrorism. So that is the three evil forces, um, they call it. And so in the past few years, you can see there are quite a few unrest in China, and mainly come from Xinjiang, the area. And so, and Xinjiang's area is a geographically is very important because it's the border of with eight different countries, five of the stands, and India, Mongolia, and Russia. And so, the the location is very important for China. And also, if you're looking at like um, why the uh, toward the west of China is like just two months or three months ago in August. China signed the cooperation and coordination mechanism, which is a counter-terrorism agreement with three different stands, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and um, Tajikistan. So they signed the agreement in August, and they already have their uh, military or counter-terrorism uh, military um, exercise, um, I think in, in September, uh, yeah, just a month ago. And, um, so you can see if uh, you're talking about um, that region, the geographical region of that area, you see that so we talk about the one belt one row and China initiate, which it looks like a bit separate with the AIIB. But in fact, if you're looking closer to the picture of the OBOR, the one belt one row, it's linked with the AIIB closely. Or I should say AIIB's project linked with the OBOR. Uh, China initiate the OBOR. And so here is the six uh, different economic corridor. That's the one belt. Because one belt, they have like uh, one, uh, the economic belt um, with the six economic corridor. And then the, the row is the marine town row, which is linked with the um, Malacca Street, um, that area. So that's the one belt and row. And here is the one belt. The belt is including six different economic corridors. And so if you're looking at the 
um, that kind of picture, whether or not um, the AIIB is an institutional means to carry out China's larger break strategy, um, or the or complement or with the China's OBOR. So another thing is you're looking at the China and Pakistan's and why Pakistan will occupy two of the projects from the AIIB. And this project basically is also complement um, with the, the economic corridor because the uh, China and Pakistan economic corridor is one of the six corridors I just mentioned. So it's the corridor six. And according to that uh, China and Pakistan economic corridor, the CPEC, China will spend 46 billion to build the highway from Gaza up to Kasha, Xinjiang's area. So it's like the whole area is uh, about 887 kilometers long from the south of Pakistan up to Xinjiang. And this, uh, um, the reason for that is uh, I think from the Chinese um, officer, they always say that um, for the in order to, for people not to rebel, not to have unrest, they have to, to, to let them uh, get rich. So for the prosperous people, their chance for them to rebel is less. And so they want to develop the area and then develop the economy over there as well. And another thing is, um, if you're looking at the deeper about the China and, 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 and Pakistan's relationship, China and Pakistan relationship not only the, this uh, economic uh, uh, corridor, but also the importance of Gaza. Um, in last November, just a few months, uh, uh, less than a year ago, they signed an agreement, uh, Pakistan's country, uh, the, the government signed an agreement with a Chinese state-owned company to lease the Gaza, the port area, to the Chinese state-owned company for 43 years old, 43 years, so they can occupy Gaza for 43 years. They can use it for whatever reason. And if you're thinking about um, Professor Jiang this morning about the um, the oil, the, um, the petrol, the shipping lane, the importance of Gaza is because of the location. So currently, um, this morning we talk about the majority of, uh, well, China is uh, the largest uh, oil importer in the world, right? And around 80% of China's uh, uh, oil coming from the Middle East, that's uh, the Middle East of the, this area. And the majority of this oil right now, the shipping lane, has to go through the sea lane, the Malacca Street, and South China Sea and East China Sea, that area. So we talked about it this morning. But if you're looking at the Gaza, this uh, location here, it's only 120 kilometers away from Iraq, the border. And assuming if all the, the natural resources, the oil, can come from inland, shifted to China, accordingly, they can save 85% of the shipping time. So that's why the highway over there in Pakistan is very important for China. And also, if from the Chinese uh, perspective, if they can, um, if they can help to develop the economy and hopefully the um, the separatism or the terrorism that the um, unrest will be less, the chance will be less. And uh, Balochi, uh, Balochistan, this area is. Uh, um, is the, the most serious one um, in, in Pakistan's area. So that is the first one the, about the geostrategic focus of, um, uh, of the AIIB project. And the second observation, as we mentioned about, is like why they will collaborate with the existing multilateral development bank, like the, M, the World Bank, um, ADB, or European Bank as, as well, etc. So I think is. Um, one of the reasons, or there are a few reasons actually, one of the reasons is try to allay the concern um, over the AIIB as a primary Chinese dominant bank that competes with the existing or the other MDB is because uh, as we talk about like um, before the establishment of the AIIB, there are lots of like the media as well, um, the media and other country politicians, they worry about the AIIB, whether there will be a competitor of the World Bank, whether, you know, you know 
the, the OECD or the Western liberal order will be disrupted by the AIIB, etc. And so this is the kind of like the China threat argument. So they try to allay the concern of the other, other country, the perception about China, about, about the China dominates the bank, and so they will, like, they're, they're happy to collaborate. Um, with the existing MDB and get the legitimacy as well. That's one of the reasons. Another reason is to try to maximize its commercial and geographical interests as well. But as we are just talking about the, the economic corridor or the OBOR, so all of the project or most of the project from the AIB, the existing AIB project, the lending project, they are linked with China's 40 billion zero project. And also expand infrastructure and connectivity to China's West, um, which is in line with the OBOR initiative. Um, and also co-financing um, can reduce the risk of lending because AIIB is very new, and probably China still have um, rely on the other uh, MB MDB to 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 learn from them how to wet the project because they they probably still um, not don't know how to do, how to do it, and so reduce the risk of lending. So that is uh, another reason. So if we talk about the um, uh, institution building, um, back to the academic debate about uh, whether China could be an emerging normal power or not, whether China, China led AIIB can we praise the existing OECD country, the norm of A giving, how A should be given. And um, so we try to get back to the two of the principles uh, we talk about, about the conditionality and tie A. And the first thing is about conditionality. And if we're thinking about the geostrategic uh, interests of China and economic interests of China, and from my perspective, I don't think China would uh, still insist on its own non-intervention that policy or low conditionality that policy because it will be concerned about um, whether they will get the get it back um, uh, for their own country, and you invest a lot to the to the Central Asia. Um, if you get nothing, then <laughs> I don't think that China will be um, that dumb. Uh, and if you're looking at the conditionality, uh, the, how to interpret about the conditionality inside China, um, start from 2013, there's a discussion about whether we should we interpret the norm or basically. Uh, gradually, um, invisibly, uh, you can see the difference about how Chinese interpret about the non-intervention policy. Um, there's a norm with interpretation inside China. Back in 2013, Wang Yijiu is a professor from Peking University, so he published uh, quite a lot of um, uh, short article and a book as well. Um, the book's title is Creative Involvement. So by meaning of creative involvement, he argued that um, China's reputation uh, in foreign aid basically was damaged uh, by this uh, um, rigid non-intervention policy. So we need to be more flexible, to be more creative, to looking at the situation, not just uh, completely uh, looking at the non-intervention policy. We have to be like, um, uh, under what condition or, or under what situation we should provide our foreign aid. We couldn't damage our reputation anymore because he's looking at from the international level, people are talking about the road state, a road, gov, road donor of China, and China is like uh, taking all the resources uh, back to his country, etc. And another, um, Bai Yinzhen um, is also from Beijing, a scholar, when he, he's also trying to reinterpret uh, the, the concept about the um, political conditionality. He said, governance and supervision are matters of administration and not considered equivalent, equivalent to political conditionality. What does that mean? That he means that as long as China is not asking another country to change their political system, then governance to supervise how they implement the project is not considered as political conditionality. So Beijing have the right to monitor you, to ask you what you need to do, um, you know, uh, how you can finish or fulfill the, the project, etc. But I'm not asking you to change your political system. 
So this is not a political conditionality. So governance and supervision a matter of administration thing. So if you're looking at this kind of like um, um, reinterpretation of the norm, and just thinking about the current thing, it just happened a month ago, uh, one or two one month ago, um, in practically in a diplomatic way, uh, China is basically asking Pakistan not to intervene into Yemen's civil war situation. So uh, Saudi Arabia, um, during the civil war time, Saudi Arabia um, openly asked Pakistan to intervene to send uh, military troops to Yemen um, to manage the civil war situation. But China said, no, you better stay neutral. Don't send any troops to there because Yemen's and, and, and China's relations is quite close. And don't upset um, you, uh, Iran as well. And so Pakistan listened and didn't do any, take any action. And so that is the kind of the intervention. And China is going to um, maybe, in another way, will we'll also use as well. So if you're looking at the conditionality, um, I think there's a basic curriculum the, from the OECD and, and China. They are quite closer, slightly closer, but differently. Not the good governance, that kind of policy, but also have some conditionality, some kind of conditionality. And if we're talking about Thai A, and because of the economic interest and the geostrategic uh, importance of um, all of the project in the Central Asia, um, Asia and I think China will stick with the Thai A as well. And so you guarantee China's interests uh, uh, won't be ruined. And so um, would there be any limits of China's institution building? I would say yes, there will be some limits. So, um, so in order to gain the international legitimacy and reduce the financial risks, uh, AIIB works with other MDBs. And because it worked with other MDBs, so basically, as I say, I use a, a borrow, also borrowed um, Eichenberg's um, idea about the strategic restraint. So if you are if within that country, basically, um, you are trying to, the, the great power set up the institution and participate in the institution, but they, on the other hand, they also uh, have a self-restraint to exercise their power within that organize, within the multilateral organization because they want to allay some of the fear uh, from the secondary state or maybe from the second power or the middle power uh, within that um, uh, organization. So they exercise strategic restraint in order to allay fears of domination. But as a multilateral institution, it's unable, unable to delegitimize the Western norms either. And um, so, and if you're looking at the bigger picture, so the function of the AIIB, um, with my um, conclusion is, I think it's a little bit the media and the politicians or, or policy makers, a little bit of um, overbroad um, about the, the function the, um, of the AIIB. So, and I think uh, China make a very um, uh, clever uh, move to set up the AIB, not just uh, not just only um, the, about the about the foreign reserve, they have to spend some of the foreign reserve to put the money uh, set in a separate different basket to gain the benefit, economic benefit, but also strategically, is also um, help to China to um, how to get the OBOR to be more successful. So the real instrument of institution building is not the AIIB, but rather the OBOR. And OBOR is basically China can have a bigger say rather than the multilateral, within the multilateral institution because OBOR is basically a bilateral uh, relationship. So what's the implication for um, Canada? So the uh, I don't, as I say, I don't uh, know Canada um, uh, foreign policy that much. But if you're looking at, because I'm working in uh, Australia, and so I try to um, compare Australia and Canada, and, and it seems like there are quite a lot of uh, similarity between these two countries. They both are, both are resource-based economies, and they both are democratic middle powers, and uh, also close allies of the U.S., and uh, a member of the OECD, 
And if Canada become a member of the AIP, and they both are also a member of the AIP as well, because Canada already applied it. So the next question is, what benefits can middle powers, such as like the Australian or Canada gain from joining the AIIB? So if you are, um, try, are trying to figure it out, because I think this table is a bit too simple, but I, try, I just um, have a um, preliminary thought about what kind of benefit can the middle power gain by joining uh, AIIB. So uh, Australia is the sixth largest shareholder of the AIB right now, but Australia didn't hold any of the, the um, managerial position, the, the president and six uh, vice president. Um, they didn't hold any, even though Australia is the sixth largest shareholder. There's a, a story behind. Um, it's like if I, I'm allowed to have another couple more minutes, I can uh, um, uh, briefly say that uh, the thing is getting back to 2014, the end of 2014. I think Australian government was um, quite keen to participate in the AIIB. And uh, when China invited Australia and other country, the 21 country, to have the ceremony, the inauguration of signing the MOU um, ceremony, and Australian government originally said, yes, uh, we are going, but then just a few days, one week before the, uh, the official ceremony, Australian government said, no, we are not going because of the pressure, or of course they didn't say that, because of the pressure from the US, the US asked people, asked the ally, don't participate in the AIB, and so Australia withdrew from the ceremony. And that is the reason that, it, but of course, after UK indicate become a member of the AIB and then Australia and other countries just follow, uh, put their hands up. And so because of that instant, uh, the rumors say um, Australia lost a chance to be one of, uh, to occupy one of the managerial role at the AIIB. So that is the rumor. I don't know how true that would be. But anyway, um, Canada, if uh, Canada becomes a member, it will be a non-regional member um, of the organization. And the non-regional member, um, according to the article um, of, the, um, of the bank, um, it, it can occupy up to one-third of the uh, power, the, the power, the voting power. So currency is only 23 or 24%, so Canada can still push the number a bit higher if uh, Canada, be Canada become a member. And then the benefits of them, I think the direct benefit um, uh, with the bank, uh, it could, both of the country can provide um, natural resources and services. And because uh, uh, if you're looking at the, the global infrastructure development uh, in the coming decade, 60% uh, of the global infrastructure development will concentrate in Asian country, the Asian region. And uh, geographically, Australia, I think, have a little bit more advantage because the, it's closer to Asia. Um, Canada probably can play another role in that. And indirectly, there are also quite lots of uh, potential benefits uh, Canada and Australia can get. Um, it's like, for example, Australia, just after uh, Australia become a, a founding member of the AIB, the two countries already just signed uh, the FTA, the Free Trade Agreement between China and, and Australia. And I uh, understand um, when your um, Prime Minister visited China last month, and they're also talking about the, the potential for China and Canada's uh, free trade agreement. And uh, there are lots of conversation about the potential trade um, from Canada as well. And also the, maybe indirectly, there's also some uh, political fruits. Um, for example, after the, um, your Prime Minister visit, and then the Chinese government suddenly released um, uh, a Canadian uh, citizen uh, who was jailed in China for two years uh, because of the spy the, um, issue. And so he was released, and or other maybe other political fruits as well. So by joining uh, the AIIB as a member and showing the good view um, with um, the dominant uh, power uh, within that organization. So that is the potential thing. Um, the, um, the relationship with China might change as well if uh, Canada become a member of the AIB. And um, yeah, we'll see how things go. And I will, I will be happy to hear your opinion and advice as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is like, if we, um, the final uh, the question which I try to propose and answer is like, get back to Jeremy's this morning's uh, uh, conversation about whether, um, Canada can influence China or, or um, 
or pull China back to the liberal order, the liberal structure. So my uh, question here is quite similar. And also one step um, um, a little bit more is like, will and can China defend and promote the established neoliberal OECD DAC norm or instead embrace the Chinese ones and accept that as the new normality and why? So the question is not just whether or not the Canadian uh, government or the, the Western country, whether they can pull China um, to uh, follow the Western norm, but instead, if China's, the, the China's rise or the economic power getting higher and higher, will China also pull other countries to follow China's norm? So that is a, a little bit different and, and two-step here. Thank you.